Simulate for Geomagic Design webinar. Um, the goal for today is to give you a good overview, hopefully, of the Simulate product for Geomagic Design. And um, I'll be covering, there's two different products that are now um, an option with Geomagic Design. And um, there's a lot of capability involved here. So we'll try to cover that, try to give you a good feel for what the products do and uh, how to apply them. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. I've got a short PowerPoint slide just to present a few things. First, I want to just go over the agenda. Um, we'll take a look at the product family. As I mentioned, there's two different products. Uh, we'll hopefully clarify the difference between those two products. We'll talk about some of the CAD associativity, some of the uh, real benefit of having this embedded with Geomagic Design or associated with it. We'll take a look at some of the key technical features. And then we'll talk uh, about a very important feature with Simulate, and that is the synchronized motion plus FEA. And hopefully we'll clarify. There have been a lot of question, uh, questions to the salespeople at Geomagic is what this does and what are some of the benefits. So we'd like to hopefully give you a flavor for what this is and, and how to uh, set up a model and how to use it. Then we'll look at uh, just some of the applications uh, for simulation. Uh, sort of to give you uh, sort of a layman's terms kind of um, a, a view of what we can do with uh, motion simulation and FEA. And then we'll take a look at a software demonstration. Uh, during the uh, demonstration, I have uh, a few poll questions I'd like to put out there. So um, at uh, different points throughout the demo, I'm going to pause. I'm going to ask that you complete the poll question uh, and answer that. And then we'll move forward. And then at the very end, we will have a Q&A. I'd like to keep this uh, mainly technical um, because that's basically the reason I'm here. Um, I forgot to mention, I apologize. I am with uh, Design Simulation Technologies. We're the OEM developer of uh, Simulate for Geomagic. And we're working closely with uh, the people at 3D Systems uh, to help get this product off the ground. So if you have any sales-related questions, licensing-related questions, I ask that you please um, hold those um, for, um, for the salesperson and contact uh, the people at 3D Systems uh, for those types of questions. We mentioned there's two products with the Simulate uh, for Geomagic, and the first one is Dynamics for Geomagic Design. That encompasses uh, motion simulation only. Okay, so we're looking at kinematics and dynamics. We use things like gravity, um, constraints, and friction. Um, it's the full, full functioning motion simulation. The other product is the Simulate for Geomagic Design. And that has everything that Dynamics has with the addition of FEA capability. So uh, not only can we do um, what's you know, a real advantageous thing here with the product is the motion and FEA simultaneously. We can also do some additional FEA capability, that being uh, some thermal analysis, uh, natural frequency and mode shapes, as well as great on the motion side and some basic uh, FEA, some static FEA. Um, perhaps in the future, it, um, if there's enough interest, um, maybe we do an additional um, web event where we look at some of these um, additional FEA capabilities. One of the key advantages of um, Simulate for Geomagic is the ability to be associated um, with the CAD system or with Simulate for Geomagic Design. So basically, once you design a model, and I'm going to show this in the demonstration, you can click a button that will export the model into the Simulate environment. All the geometry and constraints are transferred in to Geomagic, uh, or from Geomagic Design into the simulate environment. And these constraints are converted into corresponding simulate for um, motion constraints. We have a lot of capability with that. We can either choose to keep those constraints from the assembly, or simulate itself has the ability to create many different types of constraints. And I've got a slide coming up that will show some of those. And then if any change is made to the Geomagic CAD model, uh, we can send those changes and propagate them back to the simulate environment. So we can walk through many different what-if scenarios and design changes uh, very quickly um, in having these two associated together. 
So first, I want to talk about some of the motion constraints. You can see a list here of several different constraint types we have in Simulate for Geomagic. And these are basically your kinematic constraints, if you will, similar to what you have in the Geomagic Design Assembly. And once you export a model from Geomagic Design into Simulate for Geomagic Design, all those constraints are mapped to these corresponding constraints here. And we can also do real life things like model friction uh, on these different constraints. We've got actuators and motors. We've got power transmission components. We have distance con uh, controlling constraints, rods and ropes. We have separators. And then we have springs and dampers and flexible connectors, as well as user-defined or customized constraints. So as you can see, we have just about every type of constraint you would need to uh, build a model to represent its physical state in the real world. And um, if you don't have a constraint that's in the list here, you can always customize a constraint and do some creative things with it. And one thing I don't have showing here, we're going to see it in the demonstration, but I will mention that we do have collision between bodies. So if two bodies are not constrained with any particular constraint, we can always model and represent their interaction with a contact or collision. Some of the input capabilities. We have a powerful formula language and function builder, so we can build um, sinusoid functions, step functions, and we can create a, um, a large uh, representation of what our input needs to look like. So for example, this formula uh, window right here might be applied to a motor or an actuator or a spring or something like that. So we have a lot of capability and customization. We also have predefined curve, so we can choose from different harmonic curves, sawtooth, linear step, and we can also bring in data from spreadsheets. This is a great way to correlate with physical test data. Um, so you can read this data in. Um, you can also create these curves in here by inputting your own points. And we also have interactive controls. So for example, you could set up an interactive control for a motor. So while the simulation is running, you can click and drag the slider back and forth and modify the speed on the input. Some of the output capabilities, well, uh, with it being a motion simulation product, as you can imagine, we're determining all the physics of the model, so force, velocity, acceleration, momentum. We have the ability to view them in graphical and numerical form. We can also create trajectory paths. So we can trace the uh, profile or the path that an object takes during its simulation. We can export any of this data to Excel. And we can also create an HTML report. So we have the ability in here, the um, Simulate for Geomagic Design has a report generation tool that will generate a report with summary um, on the uh, information, all the inputs and outputs of the model. Some of the visual aids, we have something called the Constraint Navigator, and it allows us to cycle through the topology of the mechanism. I will show that at the very beginning of our demonstration. We can also look at a kinematic view, or as some might uh, recall it, as a free body diagram. So it's a great way to make sure that your model is constrained and set up properly once you take it from the CAD environment to the simulation environment. And then we have display vectors. So we, as you see these blue vectors showing on this, um, this grapple hook right here, we can, uh, these vectors represent the reaction forces on these different joints. So not only can you have a meter up on the screen, but you can also have these graphical vectors that represent the values of the meter. So it's a great way to visualize um, the, the increase or decrease or change in direction of the different forces occurring on the mechanism. And we have annotations and callouts and dimensions. On this uh, picture right here, you see this actuator input force. That's what we call an annotation callout. And we can customize a formula inside this callout. So for example, um, this is just simply text with a formula next to it. And as this mechanism cycles and the force changes, this value will update on the screen. So this is another way um, to sort of meter or plot data, except it's just in a annotation form. And then down here you can see a dimension between the um, jaws of this grapple. 
this dimension will change during the simulation. So um, we also have not only dimensions, but um, a closest distance tool that will monitor the distance between objects. That's a great way for determining um, the, say, minimum clearance that you'd have between objects uh, throughout the range of motion. So some might say, why, why the 4D or why the um, motion plus the FEA simultaneously? Okay, and the reason is is because um, motion loads are difficult to calculate. And when you have an FEA model, typically FEA users, they either get their data from past analyses, they get their data from physical testing, a customer might give them the data um, and they apply it to the model, but typically this data has to be known in some way. It has to have been prototyped in some way and tested. So the, the benefit we have with um, Simulate is that we're able to feed these motion loads into the FEA simultaneously and solve for all these different um, load cases. Peak loads don't always equal peak stress. So being able to cycle a me uh, mechanism through its entire range of motion will help look at all these different conditions that you can run into. And then once you find that worst case condition, we can use um, different tools such as H adaptivity where we can refine the mesh on a model and we can um, refine the accuracy of the FEA. So I'm going to demonstrate this as well um, when, we, when we come to the model. Some of the applications, um, if we sort of take off the, all the features and functionality and just sort of kind of start painting a picture in our heads as to where we can use this type of, uh, these, this type of software, um, you know, gear systems, you're modeling backlash, contact, friction. Um, we can model this system right here using constraints, or we can model it with true collision based on the um, geometry of the teeth, um, for example. CAMs. So we can um, use some of the tools in here to reverse engineer what a CAM profile needs to look like to achieve a given follower displacement. There's a couple, there's another um, uh, use for this software in reverse engineering. I guess I would refer to the uh, reverse design engineering here of the CAM um, in a similar way to uh, reverse engineering loads on actuators or motors. So how much force or torque is it going to take to cycle a mechanism. And this would be a difficult trial and error process under normal circumstances, but um, we're going to see how that we can use the software to understand this information better. And that's part of the demonstration I have is to reverse engineer some of the loads on an actuator. Mechanical advantage, inversion, uh, toggle points, um, or bifurcation points. Um, this is a great way to see if you've exceeded the travel of a mechanism or you've exceeded the, um, the range of motion uh, that it's allowed to go through. Mechanical advantage, that's something we're going to look at in this demonstration as well. Motor and actuator sizing, like I mentioned. So um, being able to determine how much uh, power requirements or uh, torque requirements are, are needed in a motor to cycle a mechanism, uh, this is a great tool for doing that. In addition, we take into effect friction, so we can study you know, how much torque is needed in this motor with and without friction and understand that difference. Compliance features, springs, dampers, elastic mounts. And then visualization and animation. It's a great sales and marketing tool for a company, being able to create photorealistic images, photorealistic um, animations, um, and uh, also we have the minimum clearance and the, the dimensional tools and things like that. Great way to visualize what's happening as well. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the demonstration. And we've got three objectives for the demonstration. The first one is to determine the force requirements in this actuator back here. The second is to look at the mechanical advantage we have uh, based on this given set of geometry. So we're going to have a force applied to the clamp pad out here and we're going to determine how much force it takes in the actuator to cycle this through that whole range of motion. So we're essentially going to be doing a force sweep um, or a mechanism sweep and looking at all the different possibilities. And then lastly, we'll look at the stresses 
uh, and deflections on this gray colored component right here, this toggle, or excuse me, this clamp shaft, and we'll do an FEA. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to toggle over to my assembly I have here in Geomagic Design. And you can see we have this clamp shaft, or the clamp, and we've got all the constraints defined in this assembly. And I am not uh, your best, uh, and, and uh, I'll probably mess something up. <laughs> um, so I'm looking here, my forte is more of the, uh, the motion and FEA. But the important thing is here, we've got it fully constrained. This, uh, these two blocks down here represent some sort of a basic fixture, if you will. If we're going to come down and we're going to clamp a part against a fixture, this big block on the bottom is going to represent a ground uh, block, and this top block will represent um, maybe a workpiece. So let's go ahead and let's send this model over to simulate for Geomagic Design. To do that, we can click on the add-ons, and then we have our simulate icon here. We'll click that, and we'll choose export. And this is locking up on me. OK. All right. Let's do this. Bear with me one moment here. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bring this model back up. I think this might be a good time for a poll question. So let's go ahead and administer the first poll question. And when this is done, I'll have the model back up and we'll go through this process again. And I, the poll is closed. So thank you for sharing your responses there. I'm going to go ahead and show my screen. And I've brought the model back up again. And so let's go ahead and let's send this model over. OK, so we brought the model into Simulate for Geomagic. And you can see the first screen we have here is just an information. It's showing us um, all the parts and constraints that were mapped over from the CAD model into Simulate for Geomagic. So this is just information. So let's close that. The second button, uh, or second window, is prompting us if we'd like to use the Constraint Navigator. So let's choose Yes. As I mentioned in the presentation, the Constraint Navigator is a great way to cycle through the topology of the mechanism. So as I click on these different parts, notice, um, for example, when I click on this arm, it only shows me the parts that are uh, connected to that, um, that arm. So I can, I can cycle through this and continuing, uh, continue going through this just to verify that all my components are connected properly. When I'm finished, I can close this, and I can access that at any time uh, through, the, through the Tools menu. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to run the model and see what happens. So I'm going to click on this button down here, which will simulate, and then stop. I know that uh, it's rather quick on my screen, but the uh, video feed can be a little sticky uh, when we're doing simulation uh, over webcast like this. But I stop the simulation, and we can see um, as I'm clicking and I'm holding this mouse button, this playback slider, and dragging it, Basically, the object, everything is falling with gravity. And I can see that gravity is acting in the negative Z direction. I can see this small cyan colored arrow. That represents gravity. So basically, the purpose of that was to show that we have several parts that are not uh, sort of grounded, if you will. We have a lot of constraints that are mapped over from the assembly. But we still need to constrain a few things in here. Um, 
so in, in terms of grounding them. So I'm going to go ahead and reset the simulation here, and I'm going to um, create a few constraints, and I'll click on my rigid joint tool, and then I'll just simply click on this uh, back part of the cylinder housing, and I'll finish a rigid constraint right there. And I'm also going to do one for this side plate, and then lastly, this other side plate. And then I'll click my select to exit that mode. And forgot one constraint here. I'm going to put one on this block down here as well. Right click, finish in place. Okay, that's one way to create a constraint. There are at least four different ways to create a constraint and simulate for Geomagic. The next thing I'm going to do is change the direction of gravity. So if I right click in my graphics area here, choose display, I can go in and access my simulation settings here. Gravity is one of them and I'll choose negative Y, and if I select this, notice that this arrow now toggles down in the negative Y direction. The units for this model, I believe, yes, they are. They're already set up correctly. Um, they come right from the or Geomagic design model, but we have the ability to change um, these different uh, components uh, individually. We have many different unit types in here. We can also select from predefined sets of units. Okay, so now that we've um, made those uh, constraints right there, let's go ahead and simulate. And I expect this body to fall right here. Right now it's not constrained to anything. Um, I could just right click on it as well and choose fixed. So if we click our play button, we're simulating. You can see the mechanism basically is bouncing. Right now there's no friction applied to anything, so this would just perpetually move um, until, we, uh, until we stopped it. So let's rewind the simulation and let's go ahead and let's hide this side plate right here and take a closer look at what was happening. So I'm going to click, drag the slider. Again, I apologize if it's a little sticky on the video playback. We have the ability to control the resolution of this playback by setting the number of frames for the simulation. Um, for the demonstration purpose, I did not use a very small time step or many frames. Um, in, the interest of, um, in the interest of time and solving. But the important thing I wanted to show is that we now have everything constrained properly and everything is just falling with gravity. So let's rewind that. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to change the constraint for this piston to an actuator. So if I click on this right here, in my properties, or excuse me, my constraints list, I can see that um, I've got this align constraint. That's the constraint that keeps this piston and shaft aligned in the bore of the cylinder. So if I right click on that constraint and choose properties, I have the ability here to change this directly to an actuator. I can also change it to any other type of constraint that I see in here. Once I changed it to the actuator, I accessed an actuator tab right here or an actuator tab uh, presented itself. And you can change this to any type of actuator that you see right here. For this example, we're going to use a displacement actuator. And then I'll click on this button here. And this brings up that formula builder that we looked at in the PowerPoint slide. I'll click on the step function. And then we'll create a step function for the actuator. So the initial value is a zero displacement. Initial time is going to be zero and we'll step at 50 millimeters in two seconds, for example. And we get a preview of what that looks like. We'll select OK, and then it converts that into a formula that the uh, program understands. And we'll select OK again. And then right before we simulate this, I'm going to do one more thing. And I'm going to go ahead in here, and I'm going to define what's called a stop control. And I can stop it when a certain criteria is met. For this example, I'm going to say when time is just over two seconds, we'll stop the simulation. Now we'll go ahead and simulate. We don't have any collision defined, so don't be alarmed that we're going right through that part. That's OK. We just want to make sure that we've got the correct input in the actuator. And if we want to verify what that input is to make sure we did it correctly, we can click on that align constraint, choose insert, meter, constraint displacement, 
And now if we go ahead and run the simulation, we get a real-time graph of the displacement. If I double-click this, I can turn off these different components. So we're only interested in looking whoops, in the magnitude here. Okay, and as I click and drag this playback slider, now that all the results and the physics are stored, it's very easy to go back and replay the animation. I can also right-click on this and change it to a digital readout, and I can show the min and max if I want to. Okay, so let's rewind the uh, simulation here. And... Um, what I'm going to do is pause real quick and ask that we administer another poll very quickly. Okay. I cannot see if the poll is going, so I hope that we are administering the poll right now. Okay. All right. Thank you for your responses. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead. I'm going to um, remove this plot in here that we created. We don't need that anymore. That was just for verification. And um, let's do one more thing just to clean things up a little bit. Let's go ahead and let's hide some of these other constraints. just makes it a little easier to view the contents of our model. I'll hide these uh, fixed constraints, and I'm going to hide all these cords. Um, the cords are the basis for the constraints, and let's hide those. So that's a little bit cleaner, and I only left the constraints um, that are uh, constraints used for the uh, movement of the mechanism. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to change the material of these components before we go any further. And I'm just going to select that first component. and right-click, choose Properties. And we've got a material database in here that we can use, or it will bring the material over from Geomagic Design. In this case, we didn't have any material specified. So we're just going to go ahead and do this inside of Simulate. Be advised, too, that anything we do, such as changing the mass of something or, um, or at changing the material of a, a component, it does not change, it does not make that change in the CAD model. It's a unidirectional behavior. So any change you make to the CAD model propagates to simulate, but not the opposite. So I'm going to select steel from our material list. Select OK. So now all of our components are steel. And then one of our objectives was to determine the actuator force required to achieve a given clamp force out here. And we also wanted to look at the mechanical advantage. So both of these are sort of going to be done at the same time, as we'll see. So I've got different forces I can use. We have a torque up here. I'm going to use a linear force, and I'm just going to apply it to the clamp pad. Let me zoom in so you can see that better. I'm going to double-click the force to open up its properties, structural load, and then we'll say it's face normal. And then we'll apply say maybe negative 500, negative will now be acting into the face. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's create a meter before we simulate, and that meter is going to monitor the actuator force. So let's click on the actuator uh, constraint, choose insert, meter, actuator constraint force. We're going to take a look at the force on the piston. Notice how we have different um, reference frames or coordinate systems that we can express this data in. We'll express it with respect to world. That would be this coordinate system here. Choose OK. And we'll go ahead and we will cycle the mechanism. OK, and it stops at two seconds. I'm going to go ahead and double click this and choose the formulas and turn off all the other components. OK. 
Okay. So we can see what force is required in this actuator to achieve a given clamp force of 500 uh, newtons at the clamp pad. And we can see that the mechanical advantage in this system, or in this case it's a disadvantage because you can imagine to achieve uh, a 500 newtons of clamp force, we're requiring quite an excess of force in the actuator. So it's not, not the best mechanical advantage system, um, but this is what we have in terms of packaging and design um, as far as fitting that, uh, that size link in there. So it does, it's not really suitable for the length of time that we have here, but this would be a great example of how we could now toggle back to the uh, geomagic design CAD model, make a geometric change, and come back in here and run the simulation again and see how that affects our mechanical advantage. We could see here that we've actually got more force um, up at this position right here. So depending on where we're going to stop the clamp force for a certain type of fixture, we're going to have different uh, mechanical advantage here. Okay, so that also shows us not only the mechanical advantage between the two, um, but the force required in the actuator. And for example, we can do something else. I'll double click on this, um, this meter here, and I can grab this expression and I'll choose copy, and then I'll click on the annotation tool right here, and I'll just drop a note in the screen, and then we'll say 500, and first I'll put a parenthesis because we need to specify the units on here, divided by, and I'll paste in the formula that we stole from the meter there, and then I'll say N for Newtons, and then up here, we can give this any sort of name, called mech advantage, okay, okay, actually I'm wrong because mechanical advantage doesn't have <laughs> a set of units, okay, so if I run this now you can see this changing in real time, okay, so it's a pretty low mechanical advantage for this particular model. Okay, what I'm going to do now, now that we've sort of determined how much force was required in the actuator and we were able to determine what sort of mechanical advantage we had for this particular model, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to remove the force that we applied and I'm going to replace it with a true collision between this clamp pad and this fixture top. Before we do that, we need to sort of define the fixture top in here. And um, I purposely left any constraints out because I wanted to show you how we could create cons some constraints right in um, Simulate. What we're going to do is we're going to add a spring between this top uh, fixture top and fixture bottom. And the spring will also act as a sliding constraint at the same time. So I'll go to the constraints list here and I'll choose the linear spring. And then I'll hover over my uh, my two coordinates here, or my two vertices, I grabbed the wrong point, let's rotate, it likes to pick up uh, edges, hidden edges and things like that, um, unless you have cords created first, so we'll choose that cord, so there's our spring, let's double click on this to open up the properties and we'll set the stiffness of this spring to something like oh, 15 newtons per millimeter. I think it's going to compress about 40 or 50 millimeters, so it'll be a re reasonable amount of force. And then we'll put some damping on here strictly so we don't have any vibrations once it comes down and, um, and collides, uh, the clamp pad collides with the fixture top. So we'll say something um, maybe like five. Okay. And then back in the constraint tab, I'm going to, uh, right now this spring is just a point-to-point -point spring. I'm going to say that it cannot rotate, it can only slide, so it's acting as a constraint as well. And then we'll join those together and use the join feature because it sees these two cords or the basis for the spring ends as being separated. It just wants to warn us that this is uh, sort of a broken constraint, 
we can simply say that's okay, it's acceptable, and now we've got our um, sliding constraint with the spring. To add the collision, we can simply click on one body, hold down the control key, click on another body, and then choose collide. And then I'm going to go ahead and right click again. Those two bodies are still highlighted, so any change I make is going to change the highlighted bodies. And I'm going to come down into the properties list, and I'm going to turn on the contact tab right here. So these features down here will turn on different tabs in the properties window. As you can see, I have many different things, such as center of mass, uh, inertia properties, and as I go through and check these different buttons, they'll activate the different tabs in the properties uh, window. We're going to use a single point contact. We're also going to change the coefficient of restitution to point 0.1, something not as, um, as resilient as uh, uh, because we're using steel on these components. Okay, and then lastly, we'll click on the spring. We'll insert a meter for the constraint force in the spring with respect to world. Okay, so now we have our other plot show up from our actuator that we had previously. And I'm going to remove this mechanical advantage flag because we no longer have the, uh, the force applied um, to that uh, clamp pad, and we already know what that mechanical advantage is. So let's go ahead and let's run the simulation. Okay, and what am I missing? Oh, made a mistake here. Mistakes are not good when you're live. I can right-click on this part. I, I fixed it earlier, so the fixed uh, constraint is overriding the collision. <laughs> so let's go ahead and let's run this again. You might see some spikes in the data, and that simply can be fixed by changing the uh, number of output frames. Let's go ahead and do that. A little choppy. The number of um, animation steps or output frames that we're using. <clears throat> Which is, as I said before, it gets a little bit slower when um, we're simulating. Okay. All right, so if I click and drag this slider back and forth, you can see we had our collision. We're not really interested in what's going on ahead of time. This is simply some numerical um, error that's in um, while, you know, while it's before the collision. And then once we are in contact and colliding, we have that, uh, that smooth curve coming down. I can adjust these scales and uh, units and things like that as well. Okay. okay, so pretty simple to set up a collision in here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to do an FEA on this component using all the forces in the system, and we're going to let the software calculate um, what those loads are automatically, and then those loads will be applied to this clampshaft right here for an FEA. Before I do that, I'd um, like to go ahead and administer another last poll question that we have. So if you could go ahead and answer that, I'd greatly appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much. So we've been running um, some simple motion analyses here. Now we're interested in running a um, FEA on this component. So what we can do to do that is um, we can simply right-click on the component we want to do the FEA on and choose Include an FEA. Now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hide some other things. I want to show you what's going on here. You can see these arrows appeared on this part. So let's go ahead in our list. 
and let's expand the clampshaft. Notice how the clampshaft in the browser has sort of a rainbow color or your traditional FEA rainbow plot uh, color next to it. So that's indicating that it's included in the FEA. So if I click on that and I click on, hold down my shift key and click on all these um, mates associated with that, I can right click and I can hide all others. So that isolates just that uh, clampshaft there. So what these arrows represent are the forces on the motion joints being applied to this part. Like you would at an FEA, you apply loads on different surfaces and edges and things like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to direct where those loads need to be applied. So if I right click on this uh, set of, first let's turn on this additional one that's missing, there we go. If I right click on this uh, force graphic right here, choose distribute on face, and I can choose to distribute it on this face right here. This one is already correct. We can see that it's applied to that uh, cylindrical face. If it wasn't, we simply right click on the graphic, choose distribute, and then select the face that it needs to be applied to. Do the same for this uh, fixed constraint over here. And then lastly, this uh, other constraint that's in here is already set. These constraints are difficult to see right now, but um, if you want to see them better, you can choose translucent, and then we can see we have um, two constraints there, a fixed constraint, and another constraint here. So four constraints associated with this part, four distributed uh, load entities is what we've uh, just finished doing right there. Let me change the visibility uh, back out of translucent. Okay. So now we can either do a, a simple static FEA and solve it right now, or we can do a sweep. And that's the real advantage of Simulate for Geomagic Design is that we can sweep through the entire range of motion and solve the FEA simultaneously. So I'm going to click on the um, little drop down next to the Simulate Play button here and choose the Motion with FEA. And then I'm going to go ahead and choose the Solve button. And I did not specify a mesh in here, so it uses the default mesh, which can be very coarse. And as you can see, this is not something I'd uh, bank my final results on. But that's okay, because all we're doing is looking at getting into the worst case scenario. Once we find the worst case scenario or scenarios, then we can use additional mesh refinement capabilities. So we have things in here such as um, mesh control, um, H adaptivity, we have the ability to control the mesh size or the starting mesh size. Um, and there's a few more features that we use to um, increase the accuracy of the FEA elements. So you can see it's solving right now. We're at about a half a second. There's other tools in here that we can use once the FEA is complete. I'm going to show one of those. Um, which is ISO plotting, um, but we also have um, sectioning and probing and things like that. So as we hover the mouse over the part, we, it won't do it right now because it's in the middle of a simulation. As we hover the mouse over the part, it'll produce a flag next to the cursor that shows you the values of the stress or displacement or strain, whichever you're viewing at that time. We can also use clipping planes to clip through the part. And these are great tools um, to clip, uh, you know, to get into these parts because sometimes the highest stresses are not right on the surfaces. Um, they might be deeper inside the part. So we need to get in and look at the entire volume of the part. The H adaptive meshing technique that we use, by the way, and you're going to see here in a minute, um, what that does is that refines the number of elements and the size of the elements. So what it does is you can, you can say that you want to achieve a certain target error, and a stress error, or you're trying to achieve um, a certain uh, displacement error. And once you set that criteria and run it, the program automatically will find those high error locations and refine the mesh only in those areas. So that's a great way to speed up the FEA process and not have to spend time refining the mesh in areas that don't need it. Initially, one might think that an edge right here 
uh, just because it's a sharp corner might have the highest stress. That may not necessarily be the case. So this is a great way um, for the software to work for you. Looks like we're getting close to the end here. Sometimes it can be a, a little impatient in real time, but we have to uh, we have to really look at how many FEAs we're doing um, simultaneously right now, and how long this would normally take in a standalone program, unless we had to write some sort of a script or something like that. But even so, in your standard FEA programs, you're not able to sweep through an entire range of motion like we are here and find the worst case scenario. So we're just about at the end here. Okay, and that's complete. I'm going to turn off my, excuse me, my triad there, so that's not in the way. And I'm also going to go ahead and turn off my constraints so that these force graphics turn off. We have a better view of just the part itself. Okay, so as we click and drag the slider, you can see basically there's no stress here because we're not in contact with the top of the fixture. Once we contact the fixture, we can see we have high stress immediately when it contacts and then it uh, alleviates itself. Okay, So we could choose any particular spot, for example, um, say right here if we're concerned about this location. And then we can go into our FEA settings, and we can turn on the H adaptivity. And we, this is where we set our criteria for the H adaptive refinement. So in this example, we're going to choose maybe uh, hit a target error of 5% in the stress. And then we'll choose a maximum number of iterations of 2. And then we'll go ahead and launch the H adaptive solve. It's telling us that it's going to delete the mesh that we have. That's okay because we want the software to refine it. Okay, so what it tells us here is that it achieved a target error of 7.25% in two iterations, which was not enough refinement to achieve our target error of five. So we have the ability here to continue. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then once it's done, I'll go ahead and I'll turn on the mesh so you can actually see what the mesh looks like. Looks like it's solving it again. I will mention here, we're going to be getting close to the end of our, our uh, webcast, and there's a lot of capability that we haven't seen in terms of thermal analysis and vibrations. Um, but we have, that's all located under this button right here, excuse me, this button here. If we click on that, I think you probably saw it before. That's simply where we toggle to the different analyses. Okay, still solving there. We do have the ability also for photorealistic rendering and in terms of creating some nice images with shadows um, and reflections. And we also have photorealistic uh, videos, so we can create some nice AVI files with just the model. Um, we can also create AVI files, say, where there's um, plots showing on the window and uh, capture those in the AVI, AVI file. So great, great sales and marketing tools as well. And that's all located under this uh, toolbar that you see right here. I think we're going to be running close to the end of our, um, our show here, so we're not going to have time to get into that too much. Looks like it's reading the results. If you were to make a design change to this model in the CAD environment, you can either use the export button again from within Geomagic Design, or you can also click on Tools and Update from CAD. Okay, so it's finished. It looked like it achieved its target error. It, we've exceeded it, actually, four iterations. Had quite an increase in the number of nodes. 
So let's go ahead and close that. And you can see our results are quite different now in terms of the max, maximum stress as to what we originally had. So if I right click on this and show the mesh, might take a second to redraw here. It's probably um, a pretty tight refinement. And there you can see uh, how it automatically refined, left the elements large out here where there was not a lot of stress. But in on that uh, sharp corner there, there was a lot of stress, a lot of error, and so it did its automatic refinement. So all in all, that was a pretty quick process to sweep through that entire range, find a worst case condition, and then refine the mesh um, to achieve a certain accuracy for the FEA. Now we have other tools in here, like I mentioned before, if we right click on this and choose show deformed. We're looking at the deform mode shape. It's scaled by 273 times. We, can, we have the ability to uh, control that. And then if we click on the animate FEA, and click on this button to animate it. It'll first create uh, probably 20 frames in this case. And then once it's done creating them, it moves relatively fast. So now we get a great idea of the actual deformation direction of the part. I'm going to go ahead and stop that. One more thing I mentioned, if I click on this body, I mentioned ISO surface. This is a great tool for getting inside the volume of a part and, oh, I'm in deformed mode shape. You can't be in deformed mode shape when you use that tool. It's a great way to get inside and isolate some of those uh, higher stresses. And it's not going to let us use it because, okay, there we go. So if I click on that, takes a minute to redraw just because of the number of elements that we have, but we can specify a target value. So we can see that these are obviously the highest, uh, highest stress locations right here. And as we click and drag our slider, it might be a little stumbly just because we have so many elements. And we can show values above or below a certain value. So as a designer or an engineer, I'd probably go in and I would first add a fillet on that, um, that sharp edge right there, and then come back in, run that exact same load case, and see what the difference was in the stress. So we've isolated um, that key area right there. 